Okay, welcome students to the um, third lecture on multi-body dynamics. It's a beautiful day out there, uh, Tuesday, 2nd of March. Uh, today we're going to um, talk about uh, chapter 11 where we're going to add passive and active elements to our multi-body dynamic systems. And um, we're going to look at uh, setting up impact equations. Okay, I will follow of course mainly the book. Okay, so what do we mean with passive and active elements? Well, uh, as an example, for instance, if we talk about a passive element, I can think of a, a spring, uh, a linear spring. Why is that a passive element? Well, you, c you can apply forces, right? And then, uh, and then the thing will elongate, you can store energy and the energy can be released. But uh, there's also a thing called an active element. And what do I think of then? Well, for instance, one of the examples could be uh, like an electric motor, uh, where you have like a, um, you have the stator, right, and you have the rotor, and uh, and then the thing. Uh, well, it, it it supplies you with a, an angular speed and a torque, of course, uh, relative to 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 the um, to the stator. It's all a, a relative motion. Um, and why do I call it active? Well, because there are two wires coming out of a motor, right? And you have to plug them, or maybe three wires, if it's a, a, a three-phase uh, machine. And you have to plug that into uh, the wall socket uh, to get some, uh, some, uh, some power input. And that's, that's exactly the, the difference between the passive and the active. Eh? With a passive element, um, you can store energy and release it. With an active element, you can supply energy, and that makes some mechanical energy. Okay, um, so may yeah, maybe you could also say that an active element is a tra transforming energy, one form into a mechanical energy. Uh, okay, let's start with just a simple example, and this is the example from the book. Uh, and as an example, what I'm going to add first is to look at the passive element. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a spring to our multi-body system. So um, this is like the multi-body system, right? Bar, bar one and bar two. For now, I'm not so interested in bar two. And um, I, I take the example from the book. So the center of mass is in the middle. Eh? Beware, it's not uh, like in your homework problem. And then uh, we attach a spring. And what do we do? Well, this, we attach the spring to the fixed world. Well, that's not necessary. It can be to another body, but for this case. And then we have a pin here on body one. And between that is a spring, a linear spring, with some spring stiffness L, uh, K and some rest length L0. Of course, there's also gravity in the system, right? And then uh, this spring will exert, of course, a force on the system. and and, and likewise, then it will change the motion of the system. Um, let's talk a little bit about the spring. Uh, what type of spring do I have in mind? Well, in, in, in this case, I was just thinking of a, a linear spring. And a linear spring has the following characteristic. You have a spring force and you have an elongation. And then uh, you have this linear behavior and the angle is arc tangent K, uh, the, the spring stiffness, or in other words, the spring force is K times the elongation. And how is the elongation defined? Well, the elongation of a spring is the actual length minus the rest length. And with rest length, we mean um, 
yeah, that is the 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 unstretched length. So when there's no force applied to it, it's the initial length. And sometimes you can have a pre-stress at the rest length, but we're, I'm not going to talk about it. That's far too complex. Okay, some dimensions here. Um, let's take the case. Yeah, I think this was last year's case. L over two, and this is then a, the spring is attached to distance uh, to third L. Yeah, a little bit besides the middle point. And then the height is, this is uh, L over 2. That's the attachment point. Okay, we have coordinates of course, X and Y. And, oops, and Phi as a rotation. Now, the thing is, how do we incorporate such a, a passive element into our multibody system? And, um, yeah. The, the key word is, of course, by means of virtual power. So look, look, let's look at the, the virtual power expression. So initially, the virtual power expression we, we had for the unconstrained system was uh, the virtual power of the system, was the applied forces, right, minus uh, the d'Alembert or inertia forces times the virtual velocities, and then yeah, for all virtual velocities, uh, they should fulfill the constraints, and I, I, I will I will get there in a second. I'm gonna, not going to redo what we did last week. We will we'll fix that in a sec. But now this this is not completely correct because we have this extra element here, right? So we have to change our our uh, the spring. We have to add the spring. Add the spring, and how do we add it? We have to spring the the virtual power of it. Huh? virtual power. Well, uh, the power of a spring is the force times the velocity. So that's the spring force times the elongation rate, right? And uh, how does it go with the virtual? Well, remember, it's just some symbol. So virtual power of the spring is the actual force times the virtual elongation rate, uh, the velocity. And then the whole system, uh, the system now, is this delta P plus this delta PS. So we're going to call that delta P star or something like that. We have to add that up. So we have to add that to our virtual power expression. So we now get virtual power for the whole system is what we initially had. Uh, the Applied forces uh, minus the uh, inertia forces times the virtual velocities. And now we're going to add, and I'm going to add, add the, the virtual power in a very uh, strange way. I'm going to add it with a minus sign. I'm going to add this virtual power of the spring delta dot delta. Or maybe, yeah, I first should write minus delta p spring, and then we're going to repeat this. Oh, I can do a copy-paste, of course, up. So we're going to repeat this, this, and then, oh, come on. And then I say minus, and what was this expression? This is the spring force times the virtual velocity rate of the springs. Okay, and of course then, um, yeah, for, for which velocities, well, all velocities which fulfill the constraints, right, virtual velocities. And, and remember how we, how we did that with adding those, those things, then we used those Lagrange multipliers. But for now, uh, let's stick with this. Now we notice that here we have virtual velocities of the center of mass of the bodies, and here we have virtual velocities of the elongation of the spring. Meaning, we have to express everything, of course, into the virtual velocities of the CM. Meaning that our elongation delta L, which is of course a function of our coordinates, uh, we can write for that the delta L dot, right? As a function of our coordinates and maybe also of our speeds, right? And of course everybody already knows how that goes. 
Um, you just take the partial derivative, so delta L dot is the d delta L with respect to xi times the xi dot, huh? summation over the i's. And we have even a short, shorter hand notation for this. This is delta L comma i x dot i. So we have to differentiate the expression for the elongations with respect to our coordinates. If we do that then, we have it expressed in our um, in our center of mass coordinates, and then uh, for the virtual ones, we can add that here. So let's take this expression, right? Yeah. Okay, put that here. Oh. There's a S. Where did the S come from? Oh, yeah, that can go away, right? X, S, this one. This goes away. So uh, now instead of writing here this expression, we're going to take this one, right? And we're going to put that here. And we're going to put the virtual here. Uh, yeah. Oh, I lost, I lost the other expression. Oh, hmm. Okay. Oh, virtual delta L dot is delta L comma I virtual X dot I. Okay, so now we have our, our expression and um, yeah, we also, we should also add our constraints, right? But for, for now, uh, forget a little bit about the constraints. I want to focus first on this. So what is this exactly? So let's look again at our problem. Um, in our case, we have here this, this body. We have here the center of mass in the middle and here this pin. Here we had the spring, right? And then we had this thing attached here. Now, um, if we give everything a name, so this we call E, this we call D, we need coordinates here, x and y. We need phi, of course. This was body 1. This was L over 2. And this was uh, 2 third L, right? Well, how do we calculate now the, the elongation of the thing? So it was k and L0. Uh, what do we take for L0 here? Um, I think we took L over 2. It's just a number. Um, oh, yeah, so the such that, well, what, oh, I have to put this condition in L over 2. Okay, so now we have here this attachment point, we have this attachment point, we have the spring. We can calculate the length because that's uh, the difference between the coordinates and then the square root out of that. And then minus the initial length, then we know what the elongation is, and then we have an expression now. How do we how we do do that? So we have to find these positions x dot uh, x d and x e. Yeah, and if we have those, then we can calculate what the length is. That's just the norm, eh? and let's take uh, the uh, e minus d or d minus e, whatever d. What did I do? D minus e, d minus e, and we take the norm of that. So. What are these positions? Well, the position of point D is, of course, a function of uh, the uh, center of mass position of that body. So that's x1 uh, plus, oh, now we need this small distance, right? We need the distance between the attachment point and this one. But I know because if this is 2 over 3 and this is 1 over 2, then this is L over 6. Uh, 3 over 6, 2, two uh, 4, no. 4 over 6, 3 over 6, 1 over 6. So uh, L over 6, that is the distance from the center of mass, plus L over 6 times the uh, cosine of phi 1, right? That's the position of point D in the X, and in the Y, likewise, sine phi 1. X E, in our case, it's just a, a fixed point with an x-coordinate of 0 and a y-coordinate of L over 2. Then if we calculate the length, and on purpose I say watch it, it's a function of all these coordinates, right? 
Then we take the square root. Oh, oh that's a nice scribbly line. The square root of the difference in the x coordinates and the difference in the y coordinates. So that is x1 plus l over 6 cosine phi 1 minus 0 squared plus y1 plus l over 6 sine phi 1 minus l over 2 squared. Now, I'm not going to proceed. You see this is a function of the coordinates. I can determine, and of course the delta l is also a function of the coordinates because it's this l xi minus uh, the l0, but that's a constant value, right? And then, yeah, the, the d eh, delta l dxi, I mean, you can calculate those. You have to, to differentiate this function with respect to x, with respect to y, and with respect to phi. So there are only th there are three components. And um, yeah, for generality, I'm not going to use, of course, delta l because a passive element can be any type of element. So we we'll put it in. A, we're going to put it in a general framework. And the general framework is that we're going to express all these elements in the form of some functions of, of all these, these extra uh, passive type of elements, S, and they're all a function of Xi. And then of course in our case uh, this is this delta L, and then of course we can take the, these partial derivatives of them, so we get the C S of I times this delta X dot I, times of course forces, and yeah, these are these forces Fs. So this is the term that we're going to add to our um, to our virtual power expression in generality. Uh, note that we have three partial derivatives here eh, with respect to x, with respect to y, and with respect to phi. And we will need that later on. So what, what will happen then again? So let's now make the whole story complete. Um, so I start again with a delta P star. No, oh, it's a delta star. Oops. I want to have a delta P star. Delta P star is this uh, applied forces, inertia forces, uh, minus, and then uh, we take all these extra elements, Fs, and then Csi delta x dot now we can make a J out of that, right? Because we have a J everywhere. J. Um, no, I make a mistake. Sorry. Oops. I don't know why I put a J there. Why did I write J here? Stupid me. Okay, minus F S. S comma i delta x dot i. So those are of course the uh, the additional elements, the power, and then I'm going to add the the constraints, uh, and, and then I'm going to do also with a minus sign lambda k c k i delta x dot i, and this one should be zero for all virtual velocities as long as they're not zero. So I've included all these extra. Uh, elements, right? And these are the constraints. Then, of course, if we do that for all these uh, virtual velocities, we end up with a, with the following uh, set of equations. Actually, yeah? we get F i, as many i's as we have, minus m i j x double dot j, and then minus. F S C S comma I, eh, Jacobian of the like the uh, spring, the elongation, or uh, rotary springs, or any other type of element, uh, and then minus the lambda k C K I, and that should be zero. Now uh, let's underscore what is known and unknown. So what are the known things? So known is uh, the applied forces, the mass matrix, right? Uh, the spring forces, yes, eh, because depending on the state of the system, we can just calculate what is what is the spring force. 
So that is a known quantity. Uh, this Jacobian is a known one. Uh, the Lagrange multiplies we don't know, and this Jacobian we know. So the unknowns in our equation are clearly the accelerations x double dot j and the Lagrangian multipliers lambda k. So if we then reorder our terms, and we get the following thing, we get uh, we put all the unknowns on the left hand side and all the knowns of course on the right hand side. We get m i j x double dot j. Eh? That's an unknown thing. Well, the m i j not, but uh, the accelerations are unknown. And then, um, uh, since we put it on the other side, plus lambda k c k comma i, eh? that is the first part, equals, and then we have f i minus, and then we get, um, yeah, I'm going to change the order a little bit, and uh, because it doesn't matter when you, you'll, you'll write that uh, c s comma i, uh, sorry, fs. And maybe I should change the order here too. So, um, move that guy out of the way. Then we see it, uh, the order in the this whole index notation doesn't matter. But the next step is, of course, I'm going to write it in a, in a matrix vector form and then we have further matrix tender vector. Uh, and then, of course, we have the constraints. And the, the constraints are on the acceleration level, right? And the constraints on the acceleration level are c k j x double dot j equals minus c k l m x dot l x dot m. And this set is actually the complete set of equations now, which we then can form in a nice yeah, mixed mode. Uh, notation, so C K I. Then here we have the unknown acceleration x double j and the unknown Lagrange multipliers, and then on the right hand side we get our applied forces, and then suddenly we now have this extra term minus C S I F S. Yeah. And then the second set is of course C K J zeros and then minus c k l m x dot l x dot m. Okay, this guy is our new thing. So let's focus on that. What happens? What does it ma mean? Well, if we talk a little bit about this, philosophize, what do we see? We see on the right hand side that uh, besides the applied forces, we now also have forces due to springs which are applied at the center of mass, but they are not applied directly, they are applied through a transformation. And that transformation is this Jacobian CSI, or in our case for the spring, the spring elongation partially derivatives with respect to these coordinates. Now let's draw a picture for that. So in our case we have our, our uh, body one, and let's just focus on this body because that's the only body which has this applied thing. So this spring is some spring force, right? Remember something like this spring force, and the spring force is known eh, because we can calculate at a given configuration what is the elongation of the spring. Then we pump it in our linear spring equation, and we get out a uh, force. So it all depends on the state of the system. So depending on the state, we find the force. But, of course, in our multibody system we can only have forces applied at the center of mass. Now what does this CSI do? It's like a magic trick. And the magic trick is that this Jacobian transforms this force to the center of mass. So it makes this system out of it. We now have a center of mass here, and there's a, a force here in this direction, and there's a force here in this direction, and then there's also a torque. So there's suddenly a, a f as x, uh, y of course, y, f as x, and there's a an s. And what are they? Well, look at the equation. You can immediately identify them as follows. 
the F, oh, I should minus here, but the sign convention, FSI, FSX, FSI, ah, MS, oh, dirty writing, come on guys, don't do that, kill it, okay, again, the FSX, the FSY, and the MS are, well, by definition, this, right? Uh, the R is minus CSI, CS comma I, times the FS. Or in other words, no, I should put it a little bit down because I conflict with my figure. Yeah. Or in other words, you have here this, and now we can write it out, you have this DCSD. X i, have the d c s d y, uh, and in our case the i is one because it's about body one, right? And the d c s d, uh, not that one, d phi one. Yeah, so let's make a proper one out of that. Okay, so that's a one, and that's a one with a minus sign. And then the FS, well, that's just a spring force which we can calculate as, uh, in our case, we just calculate what the L is depending on the coordinates minus the L0, and then we multiply it with the K. But that's just a number which you put in here. So we see magically this Jacobian transforms our spring force to forces at the center of mass. And, that you, and you can do that with any element. So you, you can add like a, a thousand elements and then you have a thousand contributions on your right hand side. Okay, that compromises the passive element. Now for instance an active element. And I said one of the examples is a, a motor, an electric motor. So you have like a stator, and you have a rotor, right? And then there's here a torque. Uh, and this torque is of course relative to, to the torque here at the base. And then you have an angular speed here, omega, and that omega is of course the, d the difference between what the rotor and the stator does. So actually we have a rotation here, phi 1 of the housing, and we have a rotation here, phi 2 of the rotor. And then you could say in exactly the same manner, oh, we define a, a, a delta phi, eh? which is phi 2 minus phi 1. And then we can express, uh, oh yeah, we have electricity. I always forget the electricity, which you have to apply 220 volts or whatever, 380. Uh, we have this, this uh, relative rotational speed between the, those two things. Then, uh, and then you can define, okay, um, this again is, uh, is like this function, eh, C of the motor, as a function of the xi coordinates, eh? in our case it's just phi 2 minus phi 1. And then you can define, okay, what, what type of torque does the, the motor uh, supply? Well, um, in our case it's not about uh, uh, the, the angles, uh, like with the spring, but it's about the angular speeds. Eh? So uh, we can define, uh, instead of this, uh, uh, this uh, in the angles in the angular speed, we can define what the motor does, and then we have, for instance, a DC motor. What does the DC motor do? Well, at a certain uh, angle of velocity, omega, eh, which is then defined as, in this case, omega is just the C dot, eh, of this, this xi, xi dot, and in our case it's just simple phi dot minus phi 1. Eh. So in, not instead of c, but in, instead of c dot, so one, one more derivatives, it's defined as this. Uh, the torque is a certain function of the uh, angular speed, so if, uh, if you have a DC motor, so a direct current motor, and you stall it, eh, zero speed here, then uh, you get the highest torque, and then, uh, and then it's, uh, when, when the, the, the torque load is, when the load is reduced, and, uh, and then you get some speed. So if you just plug it in and there's no load, you hear zzzz, and then uh, that's, that's the speed by which it goes. And of course this, if you, if you increase the voltage, uh, then, uh, so this was the voltage, 
then of course this, this, this torque will increase. So th those are the figures for this active element, like an electric motor. Uh, and then you also, this was a direct current motor, and you also have an alternating current motor. That's a bit different. Then you have, um, uh, again, a torque, but uh, there's a peak, and then it, it drops down a, a, at the synchronous speed. And usually you operate the machine in this area. Why? Because, well, then the angular speed is almost constant, and you have a large variety in, in torques which you can supply, and braking and, and accelerating. Uh, and that, that's the way these engines are used, and you find them everywhere. In your drill and in your car, electric car. And so, in essence, now the, the torque is a function of our, yeah, of our, our C dot, in our case. Huh? In, our, in our case, the T is a function of omega. And in general, in general, you can of course say, well, these, uh, these element forces, these extra forces, uh, yeah, F element, they are a function of, well, they can be a function of time, they can be a function of some uh, actuation, right? And then they can be a function of C and C dot. So position and velocity, that's in the general case. Okay, no. So, um, I think there's also a small example in the book. How much time do we have left? Oh yeah, quarter of an hour. That's sort of fun. Okay, now we, we, we finished the, the elements. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about impacts. Impacts. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Okay, Jason is doing a good job, I see. He's giving an answer to the, to the chat. That's great. Um, I see no messages like things go audibly wrong. Okay, last quarter of an hour I'm gonna uh, wanna talk about impacts. Now what is an impact? Ouch. There was an impact, right? So what did it characterize? Well, a noise of course, we heard a noise. The other thing that was, uh, it hurts, like ooh. Now why does it hurt? Um, because the force was high, I guess, right? Uh, and what was the other characteristic? It was almost gone before you noticed it, right? Did you see it happen? So in a very short duration you have a very large force, which then disappears again. So that, that, is, that is what we think about an, what an impact is. It's an idealization of something. But it's in the same realm as the idealization of a rigid body, because, well, bodies are not rigid, right? Most bodies. They seem to be rigid, but they're not. So, but as an idealization, you could say, oh, I'm a rigid body. Um, let's start with a very simple example about these impacts. Uh, oh yeah, first of all, when I think about impacts in our multi-body system, wh what do I think of? Well, for instance, uh, your double pendulum. Uh, you have this is double pendulum nicely, and, and it's, it's nicely swinging like this, and then there, here's a wall, for instance. And then it's, it's coming towards the wall, and then suddenly, of course, it will bang, it will hit the wall, right? So that is the things I'm thinking of. You could also think of walking, uh, where, where you have a person who is walking, and then when his feet is going to hit the ground, uh, that's also like an impact. Some people can walk with almost zero impact to the ground, like that you, with your foot you touch the ground, some do really like bang. Anyway, those are impacts. Uh, let's look at a simple example. Oh, um, I'm going to talk until a quarter to three, and then we'll, we take a short break, and then we'll go in the Zoom, right? It's really one hour, the lecture. Simple example. Um, and it's, it's actually like this. I have a, a mass, M1, and it has some velocity, V. And I have another mass, M2, 
one and two, and it has also a velocity u. And um, let's say that the, that one is catching up two, otherwise no impact will happen. So bang, huh? that will happen. Or in other words, the velocity v should be larger than u. And to the, uh, then after a while, of course, they catch up, and then bang, you have this impact. You hear a noise, right? And then since it's a very short duration, after the impact, they, they proceed. So oh, a little bit bigger. So M, M, uh, M1 then proceeds with a new velocity that's after the impact. Now I have to j uh, make a distinction. So let's call that plus and let's call this minus. So this is minus and plus. And then u uh, has also a velocity after impact u plus. And that's what's happening. And this is then time, as time progresses, right? And this is really t0, uh, the moment of impact. And this is yeah, a little bit before, t minus. And this is a little bit after that, t plus. And now we're going to analyze what is happening. So if they, 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 oh, they, they, they impact, and then, so this is the impact. Well, let's, let's draw a graph. Let's look at the velocities. So um, now I'm going to do this graph. So uh, I have time here. I have my t minus and I have my t plus. And I have two velocities. I have, of course, v minus. Uh, it's like this, right? And I have u minus should be less because um, so these are the velocities. And then something happens, and then after a while I get u plus because u is going faster, and I get v plus. So this has to go here, and this has to go there, and how I don't know in a smooth way, probably something like this, right? Okay. Uh, what is, are the accelerations? Accelerations. Accelerations. Again. Well, accelerations are zero, right? It's uh, almost constant, constant speed. Then, if we look at v, it's decelerating. Yeah? The slope is down, and then and then zero again. So, um, yeah. Something like this, I don't know, and then it's zero again. So this is uh, uh, this is minus. So this is v dot, and then zero. And u, well, uh, the slope is maybe a bit less, uh, but again here zero and here zero, and then here we get so zoot, maybe something like this plus. So this is u dot. Okay. Um, yeah, now let's analyze more in detail. Let's take the, the impact thing here, and what was our most powerful instrument for the engineer? How do we analyze that? And uh, I have it here. Remember? Scissors. So with the scissors, I'm going to cut these bodies loose. So I make three body diagrams out of this. Who? Body diagrams. And the three body diagrams in our case are, of course, very simple. Uh, how does it go? Well, I have this body one. I, I have to uh, uh, introduce a force, right? And here I have body two, and I have to introduce a force. And so this was M1, and this was M2. And the velocity was called v, and the velocity of this guy was called u. And there's an interacting force, and uh, yeah, we call it f, right? And according to Newton's, one of Newton's law is that these forces are uh, identical in magnitude but opposed of sign. Eh? So they're the, the same in magnitude but have an opposite sign. Then uh, let's write uh, uh, Newton equations for this, right? So what does Newton say here? Well, 
the sum of the forces is the mass times the change in velocity. So it says uh, minus f equals uh, m1 times v dot. And likewise, here I can say f equals m2 times u dot. Aha! So we see that these two expressions, m1 and v dot and m2 and u dot, should be identical. They have opposed sign, but they should be identical. So if we had the graph here of these u dot, v dot, then if we make that same graph for the, for the m u dot, then I would get like this, and I would get like this, totally mirror of each other. So this would be m2 u dot, and this would be m1 v dot. Yeah, totally the same. Uh, this is then the plus, this is the minus. Very nice, smiling face. Totally identical. Okay. How do we proceed? Well, actually, we want to know what the, we want to make the time shorter and shorter. So what we're going to do is, we saw this, this jump here, this, this m v dot or m u dot, and now in this finite time, and now what we're going to do, and actually this, this, was, this is the m v dot, the force, say m v dot. Now we're going to shrink time, so we're going to make the time shorter, well, and then of course the force will become higher. And we make the time no shorter and the force will become higher. And we make the time very short and then the force will become very high. Something like this. Eh? So this is when delta, the t, eh, that's t plus minus t minus, goes to zero. If you make that very small, then of course this guy goes to infinity. So that's an idealization of impact. So we make like an impulse. Yeah? This is what we then finally call the impulse. And we can do that with the equations, because now we take the equations. So we take the limit case. Oh, I was a bit too short. So we took, uh, take the limit case of t. Uh, uh, how do we, uh, this is a nice way to say it. T minus goes to t plus, yeah, of, and then we're going to add up everything here, of the integral of, then we're going to take these two equations, uh, minus f is m1 f dot dt, yeah, and we're going to take the other one also, uh, limit case t minus two t plus integral of this f is this m2 u dot dt. So what do we get then? Well, we get, uh, on the one side we get minus p, which is defined as integral of f dt of the limit case of t minus going to t plus, yeah? equals, and then we get m1, and then we can, yeah, uh, this is very simple, uh, uh, the integral of v dot is v it is itself, and then with the bounds, and the bounds are v plus minus v minus. Likewise here, uh, we have this, uh, 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 this integral dt f, which we defined as p, equals as m2 u plus minus u minus. Aha! So we now, eh, so this is the definition actually. I should say definition of the impulse. Taking the limit case, I have to take the definition. Now I can write my two equations eh, in a matrix vector form. Now what are the uh, knowns and what are the unknowns? So, um, known is uh, m1, m2, the velocity before impact of the two bodies, and that's it. An unknown in our case is, um, of course, the velocities after impact, so that's v plus, u plus, and we have no clue what the impulse is, right? P. 
I mean, we know it hurts, but that's not enough, right? Okay. Uh, so we have to form a vector. And the vector is V plus U plus and P equals, and we have, well, then I write these two equations. The first equation reads uh, M1 V plus plus P, yeah, M1 V plus, there's no U, plus P equals M1 V minus, yeah. And the second equation is 0 uh, m2 u plus and then minus p and this is an m2 u minus. Okay, um, what is the solution to this problem? Cole Porter song, maybe? Anyway, we, we have two equations and three unknown. So uh, we cannot solve that, right? At least li for linear equations, maybe a non-linear case. So what to do? How can we solve that? We need some extra information. And, um, and then you think, and you think, maybe I missed something. Maybe I have a, an equation for the, for the impact. Uh, like with the spring, uh, if I know what the elasticity is of the, of the bodies, and yeah, but on the other hand, it's an idealization, right? It's like time goes to zero and, 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 the velocity and the force goes to infinity, so it doesn't really help to have uh, any idea about the surface, I guess. Um, so we're sort of lost, actually. We have no idea. Now, w one way to solve that is, of course, to uh, dig into the literature. And uh, most of you would probably start looking at Google, but I'm a bit older, so I probably want to look at a book, and I know there's an, uh, there's an, uh, well, somebody says energy balance, but uh, what, what, what if energy gets lost during the impact? Like, for instance, if you put silipati, like, boom, like, like now with my fist on the, on the desk, bang, I mean, there's no rebound. It's an impact, yeah? So, energy balance, I think energy gets lost during an impact, at least, uh, you're, 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 you get your nose is bleeding when somebody hits your nose and uh, some tissue is torn. So. No, it's not an energy impact, I guess. Well, let, let, let's look in the literature. And I know, I know a, a, a funny book, actually. Uh, let's, let's dig it up. And it's um, close. Yeah. And this is the funny book. Um, yeah, you, the hint is already there. Right? You see pages from Newton. New well, it's of course Newton. And uh, well, this is his famous book. Of course, we haven't read it eh, because we all know it. Uh, all these three laws. Uh, law one: Every body preserves in a state of rest or uniform motion unless it's compelled to change by a force. Eh? So, if there's no force, nothing will change. Velocity, the velocity stays the same. And then the second law says, the alteration of motion is ever proportional to the motive force impressed. So he says, force equals some number times the acceleration. Well, not acceleration. And that's what everybody always says. Like, oh yeah, Newton is force is equal to mass times acceleration. Uh-uh. It says it's force equals the change in velocity. And the change in velocity can be both magnitude as direction. But anyway, here he talks about the one-dimensional rectilinear motion, but change in velocity. And then the third one, that's a funny one, to every action there's always opposed an equal reaction. Well, that's actually what we applied, right? Remember? Uh, here, uh, this is what we did. So if we then draw this, this thing, we have a action and reaction, right? And they're equal and opposite. Okay, let's go back to our problem. Let's go back to here. 
Okay, so those are the three laws. We applied those three laws. Eh? We, we applied already law number three, and we applied already law number two. So is there more? So, eh, like, like uh, little Tom said, uh, can I please have some more? Yeah, well, there's probably more. I mean, it's all in the book, right? So you have to read. So uh, corollary, a difficult word for something, some statement, and then about how you can combine forces. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for impact things. Well, this is, no, this is two positions, not impacting. I want to know something about impact. Where can I find something about impact? Gravity uh, doesn't alter state of motion. No, no, no. Motion in space. No, no, no. Abundance. Gravity. Oh, and then I suddenly was triggered by this name, Mr. Huygens. Well, I know Huygens, by the way. That's our Dutch famous uh, scientist, Christian Huygens. And look what, what Newton is writing here. By the same, together with the third law, Sir Christopher Wren, Dr. Wallace and Mr. Huygens, the greatest geometers of our times, did several uh, determine the rules of congression and reflection of hard bodies. Ah, we're there. Uh, that, that's impact, regression and reflection of hard bodies. But the beginning is very interesting. So he gives praise to his, his colleague. So he doesn't say, well, I'm more smarter than Huygens, but he says, well, Huygens is a very smart guy. And that can help him, because one day maybe Huygens will review his paper and then you think, oh, yeah, that's this nice guy, uh, Newton. I don't think he was such a nice guy in person. But anyway, I, I, I've never met him. Anyway, uh, about congression and reflection of hard bodies and much about the same, they communicated uh, their discovery to the Royal Society. That was in, in London, that was the way to communicate, not uh, via internet or whatever. And here you see the experiment, exactly what we do, right? Balls in, in reflection and congression and then, and then, oh, my boy, go away. And then he's talking about this. Thus, trying the thing with pendulum of 10 feet in, in equal and equal body, so he takes the same, eh, M1 and M2, or not the same. And making the bodies concur after the descent through spaces 8, 12, and 16 feet, strange units, I found always without an error of three inches that when the bodies con concur together, equal changes towards the contrary part. So it's very hard to understand what he's writing, but he says, well, in everything in parts. Eh? They, they never thought in absolute numbers in those days. It was always in ratio, eh? one to three, the, uh, ratio that to that. As you can see further on, parts of this, parts of that. Still we're not there. Ah, again, go away, I'm away. And now comes an important sentence. In bodies imperfectly elastic, so meaning hey, like my hands or your nose when I kick your nose, the velocity of return is to be diminished together with the elastic force, because that force exerted by the bodies are bruised by the concretions or so on, huh? and make the bodies to return one from the other with a relative velocity which is in a given ratio to the relative velocity of which they met. So he says, well, if two parts have a, a relative velocity, they, they, they come together with some relative velocity, and then after they depart, there's also a relative velocity, and the ratio of those two has a certain value. And then he investigates that ratio, and then he finds out that it's almost the same for certain type of materials. So balls of steel returned with almost the same velocities, uh, those of cork with a proportion of 15 to 16. And so he finds then that there is a law for this relative velocity which only depends on the constitution of the bodies and does not depend on how heavy the bodies are or how fast the bodies are going. That is actually the law we, we, we were seeking. So the, the missing element in our case is a, what we call a, a constitutive equation, or that's the, 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 the missing element. Element is the impact law. And in our case, it's the Newtonian, Newtonian impact law. And it goes like this. It says that the velocity, uh, relative velocity before impact, 
ratio to the relative velocity uh, after impact, before impact, is in a giver, given ratio, E, and we used to pull it, do minus. Why? Well, because with the sign convention, if we call this plus, then this will be minus, right? So we, we need a minus. Otherwise, e be, this, this constant becomes negative, which is sort of negative, to have a negative constant. So we could say that the velocity after impact, the relative velocity, is minus e times the relative velocity before impact. And this, this value of e is a material constant. Material constant. It's independent, dependent of the mass or the velocity or whatever. So it depends on the materials. And the E usually goes from zero, uh, E goes from zero to one. Uh, and then we have to say, well, what does that mean? Oh, well, what does zero mean? Well, that the relative velocity after impact is zero, so this we call a fully plastic. Plastic. It's like uh, plasticine, like boom, together. And if it's one, then, then the regression is exactly the same as, as the way they hit, so then we call that fully elastic. And in the case of the fully elastic Cartier, then there's energy balance. Because now energy will be lost, those relative velocities are the same. In our case, then, if we apply that, what is the relative velocity before impact, uh, after impact? That, so that is, now we have to uh, take a, uh, uh, say we do V minus U. Uh, you could also define it the other way around. But V minus uh, U plus, so that is after impact, is minus E times V minus minus U minus. And uh, of course you can also do u minus v, but it doesn't matter. So this law, then together with our initial uh, other law, so we, we just have to then supplement it, right? So we got m1, 0, 0, 0, m2, minus 1, and then we had a u plus v, uh, other way around, sorry. Come on. Uh, v plus u plus m p equals, and then here we have m1 uh, v minus, m2 v uh, u minus. And then the last one is this impact law, so that means uh, 1 minus 1, 0, and then here we get just minus e times uh, V minus minus U minus, yeah. Now we have to look at these equations. And to be honest, they look a lot like something we already discovered in this course. Uh, first of all, they're symmetric, right? So this is nice, um, but moreover, I see a structure, and the structure which I see is the following. I see here something like a mass, and then something like a, a, a matrix A here, and then here a matrix A, or A transpose, and zeros. And then here I see velocities um, after impact, and here I see sort of forces, and then on the other side I see, yeah, I see mass times velocities before impact, and then here I see uh, some law, something with, yeah. Velocities before impact, and then maybe some matrix in front of that uh, B, yeah, because I have to fiddle a little bit, but in a linear way, and with the minus E, let's put the minus E there. And to be honest, they, they look, of course, a lot like our uh, 
is in another way. They look a lot like the, th the, th the, th the equations we already found for the, our, our constraint equations of motion. And indeed, if you generalize now, and that's all in the book on that, so if you generalize that, generalize for a multi-body dynamic system, we get the following thing. We get the following set of equations. We get Mij, then we get a CKI, we get a CKJ zeros, then here we have the velocities after impact, then here we have, yeah, I call them a row, but I uh, call them lambda, but I'm going to call them a row K, because they're multipliers. And then on the right hand side I have applied impulses, usually they're not there, but an applied impulse, this could be like a, a hammer, uh, uh, that's not a hammer, a hammer where, where you hit with a hammer on a nail, bang, that could be an applied impulse, because you know what the mass is and you know what the relative velocity is, so you know, oh yeah, I apply an impulse there. Um, but you could also say, no, it's part of the system. So if it's out of the system, then it's an applied impulse. If it's part of the system, it's just eh, one of the coordinates. Then we have Mij, of course, velocities before impact. And now here we nicely have, of course, minus E, eh, this, this uh, coefficient of restitution, times the Ckj x dot j. And this are then generalized impact equations for constrained multi-body systems. And what are the row k's? So these are the um, contact plus constraint impulses. So these are, uh, row k's are, and let's take this case where we have the, the, the system hitting a wall here, right? Then, of course, we have here a, an, a, a row k, here's an impact, here's a row uh, between these, but here in the joints too. I mean, if you hit somebody, you also feel all these impulses in all your joints. So here, in all these joints, we also have internal these rows. So here's a row one, row one, row two, row three, row 4, and this is row 5, eh, because there's contact here. So these are all these contact impulses. And, uh, and this is just the general way how you can solve impact problems. Okay, if you want to know more details, please read the book. Oh, I passed two minutes. I have to stop this. I stop the recording and I see you in five minutes in the Zoom. So, uh, Zoom, Q&A. Zoom at, now I have to make the time, oh yeah, um, what am I going to do, 14, 4, 5, 2 hours, starts. <laughs> I'll leave that on. Yeah, and then we stop the recording.